We've reached the point in our service where we observe the Lord's table and we take bread to remember his body in which he suffered for our sin. We take juice to remember his blood which he shed to redeem us and to cleanse us from sin. We like to read a passage of scripture to remind ourselves of what Jesus did on the cross when he died for us. And uh, you might turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 3. And if you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and somebody will see that you get one. If you don't own one, this is yours to keep. I want us to consider this morning how Jesus destroyed the works of the devil, as we see in verse 8 of chapter 3 of 1 John and in order to, uh, I'll just read the context in which for verse 8 is found. So I'll read verses 4 through 10 in 1 John 3. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. The last part of verse 8 says the Son of God was manifested for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. We want to consider how Jesus does this, but first we want to see what are the works of the devil. Verse 8 gives us a clue to his character. It says that the devil sins from the beginning, and sin is opposed to the righteousness of God. Satan has worked as an adversary to God from the beginning. In the garden, God placed the first man and the woman with abundance of trees that they had the, the right to eat from every tree in that garden except for one. And God told them that you will not eat of that tree lest you die. In, the, in fact, you will die if you eat from it. Well, Satan's ploy was to convince man and woman to, to eat of the forbidden tree. And he did this by talking to Eve through a snake. He dealt with her mind first. And he, he questioned to her, in, he placed in her mind a question about God's uh, restriction on that tree. Did he say you can't eat of every tree? And, uh, and, and, and then he lies uh, when, when Eve tolls, told him that, yeah, we, we can't eat of it. We will die when we, if we would. And he, he, out, he, he adamantly says, you surely shall not die. Well, he, he's, he's implying by his questioning of, of God's restriction that God really doesn't have your best interest at heart. And then he further planted a seed of doubt in her, her mind by, uh, by saying, uh, God doesn't want you to eat of that tree because he knows if you eat of it, you're going to be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, that's a half-truth. It was true that if they ate of that tree, they would know good and evil. But there's, it's a restriction in, on how they're like God. Yeah, they'll be like God in that they know good and evil. But God knows good and evil from the standpoint of righteousness. They, if they partake of this food, 
they will know good and evil from the standpoint of participating in the, uh, the wickedness. So, so they, uh, God says, uh, or Eve began to look at the tree. Satan's working on her mind, convinced her to uh, give it another look. I'll look at that tree, and sure enough, it does look like it would be good for food. It does look like it, it's really delightful to the eyes. It presents well. It's uh, also desirable to make one wise. So she eats from it. She doesn't die physically right off. But she did die spiritually that day. She, and, she convinced Adam, and they both noticed that they were naked. It hadn't bothered them before. They now knew evil. And now they're hiding from God. They died spiritually. And they passed on this spiritual deadness to their offspring, including us. So God makes a promise right off the bat. He, he, when he deals with the serpent, he says, the seed of the w woman is going to bruise you on the head. This was a promise of a human being that would be born who would, who would actually have the div divine power and authority to destroy this, this serpent, to destroy the devil. So this penalty of sin is death, and, and Jesus is the one who came and paid this penalty of sin for all who would believe on him by dying on the cross. This opened the way for God to forgive man's sin and to count believers righteous in his sight. Jesus also overcomes the work of the devil in a person's life when he gives him the new birth. When God creates a new nature within a person, it, it uh, replaces the, uh, the fallen nature that God had had. Uh, that Satan had brought about in man. And Jesus said that unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we can see the difference between those who have been born again and those who have not in verses 9 and 10. In, the, in those verses, we see that the one that's born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him. He cannot sin because he is born of God. And by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. Before, we were children of the devil making a practice of sin. Our lives, whatever we practice, bear fruit and demonstrate who's, who our father is, either of practicing sin and our father is the devil or we uh, practice righteousness and we're the children of God who does no sin, who has no sin. Jesus overcame death, which is the result of sin, by rising from the dead. And now believers in Jesus Christ have the hope of rising from the dead and living forever in the presence of, of, of Jesus. In the garden, the devil worked on the mind of Eve in a way that she and her offspring would think contrary to God. And, and uh, in redemption, we are being transformed by the renewing of our mind. So God continued, Jesus continues to, to uh, destroy the works of the devil by continually transforming us as long as we are in this life. And the more we take in the Word of God, the longer we do it, the more we become transformed. The more we think like God, the more we become like Jesus Christ. And this is what God has ordained for us. So Christian, this morning as you partake of the Lord's table, thank the Lord for undoing the work of the Lord, of the devil in your life. And uh, be quick to confess and forsake sin. 
And if you're here this morning and have never embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior, we ask that you refrain from partaking of the Lord's table. This is for believers. But we do uh, want you to really consider seriously that Jesus Christ is the only way, the only one that has the power to deliver you from sin and from death, from the spiritual death in which you do live if you're not his. And uh, if you'd like to talk with somebody about this after the service, there will be a couple up at the front of the auditorium to your left who would be glad to visit with you. Men, come and serve us.